Uh, we are going to be looking, Mike said, at um, 1 Samuel chapter 20. So please go there, 1 Samuel chapter 20. And we're going to begin at verse 5. And we're going to go through verse 23. 1 Samuel 20. So David said to the Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I ought to sit down to eat with the king, but let me go that I might hide myself in the field until the third evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, because it is the yearly sacrifice there for the whole family. If he says it is good, your servant shall be safe. But if he is very angry, know that he has decided on evil. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is an iniquity in me, put me to death yourself. For why then should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, far be it from you. For I, if I should indeed learn that evil has been decided by my father to come upon you, then I, would I not tell you about it? David then said to Jonathan, who will tell me if your father answers you harshly? And Jonathan said to David, Come and let us go out into the field. So both of them went out to the field. Then Jonathan said to David, The Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if there is good feeling toward David, shall I not send to you and make it known to you? If it please my father to do you harm, may the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not make it known to you and send you away, that you may go in safety." And may the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. And if I'm still alive, will you not show me the loving kindness of the Lord that I may not die? And you shall not cut off your loving kindness from my house forever, not even when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord require it at the hands of David's enemies. And Jonathan made David vow again because of his love for him, because he loved him, as he loved his own life. Then Jonathan said to him, tomorrow is the new moon and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. When you have stayed for three days, you shall go down quickly and come to the place where you hid yourself on that eventful day and you shall remain by the stone easel and I will shoot three arrows to the side as though I shot at a target. And I will send the lad saying, go find the arrows. And if I specifically say to the lad, behold, the arrows are on this side of you, get them, then come, for there is safety for you, and no harm as the Lord lives. But if I say to the youth, behold, the arrows are beyond you, go, for the Lord has sent you away. As for the agreement of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. Mike. I must really love coming to this class and teaching because I left Oklahoma City at 67 degrees and light rain. <laughs> I haven't quite figured this out. You go north in the summer and uh, south in the winter, and somehow or another I've got that mixed up. <sighs> Looking at this text this morning, I thought, I, I, I wish I could be Dan Duncan and be so erudite in, in history and literature that I would give you a, a very uh, pithy opening comment or quote that he's able to do every time. But alas, I can't do that. I thought, well, perhaps I could be gifted enough in music to have given you a good title from music. So I looked that up, and these could potentially all be the titles. A Bad Moon Rising, or Blue Moon, or Harvest Moon, or Moon Dance, or Dancing in the Moonlight, Moonlight Serenade, Moon Shadows, New Moon, Moon River. <laughs> but I'm none of those things, so this is Lesson 19, The Rise of David. The context of this section finds us in a holiday, the new moon. 
which is celebrated at the beginning of each and every month. The precedence comes from Numbers chapter 28, David the son-in-law of Saul, the esteemed warrior, is expected to be at the table of the king. However, David's plan was not to put up appearances. He would be a no-show. Jonathan was to give the excuse for his absence if asked. He was to say that David, verse 6, asked for a leave of absence from me, and that was the well-rehearsed response that Jonathan was to give and deliver on time in order for him to go to Bethlehem. In verse 7, there could be two possible reactions from Saul. Whichever one occurred, David would know his current status. If Saul was satisfied with Jonathan's excuse, then he would know that malice toward himself would be temporarily abated. However, if his absence made Saul angry, he would know that he was considered now a permanent enemy. So verse 8, we have no record of him being anything but fastidiously loyal and righteous in all his behavior. Jonathan is simply a spectacular man and we want to recognize and appreciate the heavy lift that he had to give for David to put his relationship with the son of Jesse above that of his own father. And there is the reason. Here's the context. Verse 8. Kindness. That word, hesed, covenant loyalty. How many ways could we try to explain it and draw it out? The human mind simply can't. It comes from above. So we attempt to put words to it, but we're always lacking some place because there's something that we have left out in the Word. Remember back in chapter 18, it was Jonathan who initiated exemplary hesed, kindness, covenant loyalty, Stripping himself of his robe, his armor, his sword, his belt and bow, and giving them to David. And in effect, in these implements of dress, Jonathan was renouncing his right to his father's throne because the exchange of garments in Israel is the exchange of offets in Israel. Do nothing, writes the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 2, from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others better than yourself. Can you do that? Do you do that? Push others forward? Or do you look at people as rivals to yourself? I've been a believer for 52 years, and I've attempted to learn this revelation from God over those 52 years. And I can tell you that the great people who give and sacrifice for others as a consistent lifestyle go on to be great and used mightily of the Lord. And so here is Jonathan in kindness and covenant loyalty. And look at the man he is speaking to. It is a mirror of himself, David. He reciprocates that kindness. Verse 7, the words, your servant. Verse 8, your servant. For your memory, Jeremiah 45, 5. Just the beginning of the verse. 
Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. And so as long as David thinks like that, and David acts like that, he will go forward in life through hardship, through dark providences, but just like you and I, he will abound from them in victory after victory after victory. Remain a servant. Verses 9 and 10. Jonathan still believing his father would not hide anything from him. See the words, if I learn, and so you and I will too. We have been brought to faith for a time such as this by the sovereign act of God and God alone. And in that sphere that He has placed you and I in life, you will have people that disappoint you, that let you down. They are discouraging times, difficult times, the failure of people and their loyalty toward us or to their loyalty to the truth. But like Jonathan, who will be saddened and discouraged over his father, you will go through that process and it will make you more and more valuable to people because you've been there and you understand. God's plan of sanctification for us progressively is to make us wise, and in personal relationships, a little tougher. Just a little tougher. Now verse 11 comes a surprise in the narrative. Jonathan moves the dialogue, notice, to a different venue. Now they are in the field. And here we want to note the narration. The Everything begins to change in the conversation. Jonathan now takes the lead. Verse 12, I will sound out my father. In other words, Jonathan will do as his friend asked him to do. Verse 12, I will send out I will, I will sound out my father. If Saul is not favorable, I will inform you, he says. Verse 13. First, he has something to ask of God. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. I want you to observe the past tense there. He has been, or better, was with my father. So, the covenant relationship that Jonathan and David have now has stripped away the filial responsibilities of the son to a father in loyalty first and foremost. Now, he, by pledge and commitment, makes his first and foremost loyalty to David. Now that's important. I'll show you in a moment. You see, the Lord has been with Saul for the purpose of being a king. But now, this prayer request that the Lord be with David. That is a sure and certain confidence coming from Jonathan that one day David, his friend, would certainly be the king. So it is covenant loyalty, and he is praying 
for that loyalty, beginning in verse 14, for a future day. Now, don't miss that. In order now to understand this conversation between these two men, think of it this way. David represents for you and me our Lord Jesus Christ. And Jonathan represents the faithful believer. Why is he the faithful believer and not the seeker? He is the faithful believer because he has found his king. My friends, when you find the gold nugget in life, you possess it. And that's where Jonathan is now. Look at verse 14. With that in mind, David is Christ. Jonathan is the faithful and wise believer. Look at this expression. If I no longer live. Pointing to the future. It will be a day and a time that Jonathan will then need kindness. He will need mercy. He will need covenant loyalty. The pledge that they have both taken one to another. You see, the wise man knows that he's just a sojourner. He's passing through. Just making his way year after year through this life. And that that life will surely and certainly be over. And over shortly. I just had a friend. A week ago, Saturday night, 6 p.m., die of a brain tumor. My last time visiting him, as a believer, we talked about life beyond the grave. I was standing in the parking lot of Believer's Chapel. It was uh, January 1976. And I was talking to a man who had a great influence on my life, Dr. Charles Howard. And I was telling him about my sickly father and how he was growing weaker and weaker. And thinking that Dr. Howard would say something like, well, I'm going to prescribe this or I'm going to prescribe that, which I was expecting. He said something that I have never forgotten. He said, this isn't the life. You and I know that. Now, that doesn't sound very profound, I'm sure, to you. But to a young seminarian, a man who had only been in the faith at most three years, and dealing for the first time with death, a dying father, that I have never forgotten. My friends, this isn't the life. And that, in effect, is what Jonathan is dealing with here in David. Seeking out his kindness and his mercy. You see, in this conversation now, in this narrative, I've always told you, narrative is so hard because everything is important as opposed to to a line in the Proverbs or a line in the Psalms. You can identify the structure so quickly and everything is punctuated with proficiency. But the narrative, it's just a story. And if you just read the story, you miss it. 
Dr. Johnson used to say to us students, do you ever sweat over a text? Do you ever ponder a text, he used to say to us. And I thought, no, no, not really. And so I came up with an illustration of what I think he meant. You can take a boat and you can float it on the surface of a lake and you can get to the other side. But what he was really saying to us is get in a motorboat and dig up the water and make the wake and bring underneath the surface those things to the surface. Ponder. What we have got here is glimpses, tiny, yes, shards, yes, of reflection, of images, of ourselves and our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's occurring here in these intimate moments between these two friends. You see, we're one in the same as Jonathan, the faithful man. We need kindness and mercy beyond the grave. My friend that died of a brain tumor, he was a wealthy, wealthy guy. And... Uh, but the moment he closed his eyes for the last time, he wasn't worth anything anymore. He had no power. He had no strength. He had no energy. He had no voice. He couldn't plead a case. He, his days of check writing were over. His trips to the bank to draw out from his vast resources were over. He was powerless. That's what Jonathan is talking about here. He's talking about a future day. Don't miss that. We're all the same. Yes, this is David, but it's really a conversation with David's heir, his final son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Savior. Look at this phrase. If I should no longer live. In the ancient world, in the ancient world, if I took over the kingship of Warren, for example, Warren would have been king and I killed him and I took over his kingship, what would be the first thing I would do as supplanting him and putting myself in power? I would go and find all of his living heirs and have them killed. That's what the world does. Don't you see how contrary all this conversation is, the covenant loyalty is, it is in kindness that He is asking for David to be gracious and merciful to whoever is left in His line. For you and me, my friends, it is the kindness it is the covenant loyalty between David and his pledge to us as his sheep, as his children, that he will guide us home and take us when we have no power whatsoever to get us there. Verse 15, But you shall never cut off kindness from my house. Now we know what the house is. The house isn't 1605 Glendora. The house is the line. It's his heirs. And now, with that in mind, look at this astonishing 
language. Saul called David his enemy. That's what he said to Michal, his daughter, 1 Samuel 19, 17. Why did you deceive me? Let my enemy go. And look at this language from Jonathan to David. When? When the Lord cuts off. When? Stop there. What's when? When is temporal, time, place, setting, event. It hasn't happened, but it when in the future. When the Lord cuts off David's enemies from the face of the earth. There is no other possible way of interpreting this text but that Jonathan knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that David is going to prevail. And thus, Jonathan, the man with all the wealth and all the political power, humbles himself before this man who has nothing. He has nothing. David's life isn't worth a dime at this moment. And nor was your Savior and mine. He traveled through life. He had no money. Had no home. Had no place to lay his head. He was penniless. His life wasn't worth a dime. And yet... The faithful see him as the greatest single value to all of our existence. And that's what Jonathan is seeing here in this magnificent language. Look at his plea. Show kindness. Show hesed. Show mercy. Because David is certainly going to prevail out of his weakness and become the great and the powerful king of all. Look at the parallel, verse 15. David is not to cut off as the Lord cut off for David. Now get the picture. They're out in the field. Why aren't they in the field? Because David's the enemy. Saul's trying to kill him. He's in danger. But look at Jonathan's language. The one to be feared is David. Imagine that. He understood that this young man who was at this moment powerless, despised, and rejected. You remember the way described, uh, Isaiah described our Lord. We esteemed Him not. He was worthless to us. But my dear friends, and faithful servants of Jesus Christ who know His Word, you found your nugget of gold, didn't you? And you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that He, more than anything in life, is the one who is to be feared, for His power is enormous. Verse 16, And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord hold David's enemies responsible for their own destruction. The covenant with the house of David could be said, as by the critics, unabashedly premature. That's the stupidest thing I ever saw in my life. Here's a guy with all the money, 
and all the badges on his lapel and all the strength and all the resources and he's pledging allegiance to this guy who has nothing. That's because you don't see him. Jonathan saw him. No, it's not premature. Here's my answer to that. In the day, in the time that you live and hear His Word and hear Christ Jesus delivered to you, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt this is the day of your salvation right now. Don't put it off for one moment. Do not delay. And give every pledge of allegiance of your soul to Him. For He is the King. When the Lord makes something obvious, go, act, and don't look back. Fill that water of baptism at Believer's Chapel, whatever your age, and do it not for your salvation, but as a pledge and as a testimony to others that yes, I have found Him and He is my King and I am loyal to Him to the last breath of my life. That will make you the wise Jonathan and the faithful believer. Verse 17, And Jonathan made David swear again his love for him for as he loved himself. Essentially saying, their love and commitment to one another was mutual. My friends, Jesus Christ says to you and me, I will never leave you. I will never desert you. You have not seen me. But you're not to see me. You are to hear of me. The mark of the sheep is the ear and then the hoof that follows. He knows his master. And he will live his life from that point forward in allegiance to him, forsaking all other things. Because everything in life, your wife, your husband, your children, your job, your vocation, your career. Everything takes its proper place when you have made that commitment. When He is in the center, He is in the center of the wheel, then all the fragments of my life all take proper proportion and the wheel rolls with consistency. Whether John... Jonathan knew it or not, he has just set himself against his father, Saul, forsaking everything for David. You and I, whether you know it or not, in our pledge to Jesus Christ, have made this world and this system that we live in our enemy forsaking everything to follow Him above all things. You are no fool to do that. David kept his oath. Let me give you a couple of texts if you're making notes. 2 Samuel 9.1 2 Samuel 21.7 He kept his oath to David, and so will Jesus Christ to you and me as well. We fear not death. The natural man fears death more than his life. Not us. Verses 18 through 23, the long and coveted conversation in the context of Hesed, this covenant loyalty, brings us back to the present crisis. Here now, 
or David and Jonathan in the field. In real time. Tomorrow is the new moon, he said, and you'll be missed. And essentially the plan is the return to David's question of verse 10 and the initial reply of verse 12. Who will tell David the results of Saul's temperament? It will be Jonathan, the faithful. The faithful, because all of his conduct will be lived in faithfulness to the pledge of his king. Look at these words in verse 23. The matter is surely the future reign of David. So in a clandestine way involving a young man designed to communicate Jonathan's voice would provoke the witness needed with the arrows being shot and David would have a means of communication. But here's what you, we want to learn that's so important and practical to you and me from this day forward. The close of this conversation, as for the matter of which you and I have spoken. The Lord is between you and me forever. And David hid himself in the field. So essentially, the conclusion of this conversation is that the Lord will work out in the days to come and make David king. Now, how is that going to happen? He has nothing. He's all alone. He's hunted down by an army. His face is, ever, is in every post office in the ancient Near East, wanted, mostly dead and alive. How can this possibly work out? How can your dilemma possibly work out? How can it work out? It will work out because of the covenant loyalty that David has made with Jonathan and Jonathan to David. You see, what's important for you and me is not trying to figure things out. And so six weeks ago, talking to a friend that has a brain tumor and his days are numbered and he knows it. I know it. What was the wise course for him? The wise course was just to let the Lord work it out. And that's what He did. And so for you and me, the wise course is to follow Jonathan's lead. Keep faithfulness to the pledge and the relationship that you have already made. You see, whether personal or professional, we make friends associations with each and every one in all different levels of life. Marriage, family, professional. And in every case, we keep covenant loyalty. We are at peace with all men. That's our attitude and as to our trials and our darknesses and our dilemmas for today we say this with great confidence the Lord will work it out he's got a plan he's got a purpose 
My job is faithfulness to Him. One of the greatest, one of the greatest memory lines that I learned from Charles Haddon Spurgeon. It is His to provide. It is mine to obey. That's Jonathan. Keep this relationship to the center of your every day and your life will take a proper place and order. What have we learned from this spectacular man, Jonathan? That he is the serious man who thought about the future all the time. So much so, he set all of his own career, all of his own plans for himself, all of his own position and his dreams. Ah, I could run this better than my father. He set all that aside for this one relationship that would never be taken away, not even by the grave. The one that was really important for Jonathan was David. He pledged it so. My dear friends, the one who is really important for you and me is Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Master, our Savior, our King. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our study in the Word this morning. Thank you for the wisdom of Jonathan. He is a giant walking among us in the Scriptures. Thank You for His vision and the vision that You have given to each and every one of us that possess the Spirit of God. We have found our King. We now have made our pledge of loyalty and we now conduct our affairs from this point forward knowing that the remainder of our lives however long or short they will be, you will work it out for your kingdom and your glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen.